Okay, so welcome everybody. Good morning. So that's the basic course in optics and imaging. So the um, you will see it's um, it's very basic. Um, I hope for some of you it won't be too basic, but the goal is to um, maybe refresh your knowledge about microscopy, and um, I will give, we'll be giving many definitions um, <coughs> that you can after get also by downloading this uh, course from our website. Um, I'll show you quickly how you can get there. If you go to the FMI intranet, um, research and facilities, microscopy and imaging facility. And um, here, um, if you go to training learning, learning some basics, you will have all the courses that we give and the PDFs which you can download. So you are much welcome to take notes this morning, but if you just want to listen, it's fine, okay. Um, for, for those who are new, I just recommend to go also and look at this website. If you want to do more microscopy in the future, you will have a lot of information about our scopes. All of them, everything is normally up to date. You will know the, the objectives, the filters which we have, so you can know if you can do an experiment somewhere. Of course, you can always come and ask, and we can also look together with you what's the most suitable instrument, or if, if you need something, um, we, can, we can also buy it. All right, um, let's start. So th there are two parts. Um, I give many, many definitions, but you will see that one thing which come all over um, the presentation will be about resolution, uh, because it's very often uh, a question. Uh, what should be my pixel size? What should be my resolution? How can I get a sharp picture? And um, this depends on many, many factors. This is why I um, always give definitions, and very often I just come back to this first idea of how does this influence my resolution. But very, very first, I start very simple. <coughs> I think you all uh, know uh, how a microscope is, is made. Yeah. I'm showing this. I mean, you all know how a microscope is done. You know you have oculars. You know that you need to put a sample. You know what an objective is. Mm. I want to draw here your attention on the different uh, light sources which you may have on a microscope. And I do this because sometimes there is some confusion about why I don't get light on the scope and people look are looking at the wrong um, positions. Um, so you know that if you do transmitted light microscopy, like when you're in histology and you have um, a colored sample with colors and you use transmitted light, so the light source comes usually on this upright microscope from here from below, and it goes here through the sample that's transmitted light and goes up. So if you don't see anything or you have no light, you have to look whether here at the bottom of the microscope, maybe something is blocking the path or whatsoever. Then when you do fluorescence microscopy, you have a different light source, obviously. It can be a mercury bulb, it can be an LED, or sometimes it can be a laser. And the light comes here through the objective and goes back after to the ocular. And also the point I want to make is that when you look at the oculars, usually you have a given light source. And if you do laser scanning microscopy, if you're in a confocal microscope, the light, um, the, the light source is the laser. So it sounds totally obvious, but I have many people who come to me and say, I think there is a problem with the lasers. I cannot see my sample when I try to see it with the ocular. So it's obviously not the laser because it would be very dangerous to use the laser to eliminate the sample while you look through the oculars, okay? Um, so it just to help you sometimes, if you see no light, just try to think wh what source of light should be on, where does the light come from, and is there something slided in the light path or whatsoever, okay? okay. So this is just a little thing. Um, this is for transmitted light, and here I will speak mainly about fluorescence microscopy. I just want one or two slides about transmitted light. And, um, but um, one thing that you may not know or some people forgot is the condenser. It's a very important piece of um, equipment and the condenser is here to focus the light properly on the sample and there is a um, small operation called uh, color elimination which you want to achieve um, when you do transmitted light microscopy which is um, you want to set this condenser, you can move it up and down, you can open some apertures and you want to set it properly so that you get a very nice transmitted light picture. And what I've seen is that most, most people ignore this or they don't do it, and it has a tremendous effect on your 
images. If you want to have a transmitted light picture, um, um, for example, also if you are doing, for example, you have worms they are, or yeasts, and they have some fluorescent markers, and you still want to have a DIC picture, you need to do this color elimination setting. It takes 30 seconds. It's super fast. It's very easy. And I'm not going to detail it now. Just keep it in your mind. So when you're at a scope and you want to do transmitted light microscopy and you don't know how to color, ask us. Okay? It's very easy. And um, you will get much nicer pictures. Um, I just leave it here. Again, I don't go into the details because we don't have time. But the, the, the goal of the color elimination is to have a very homogeneous elimination of your sample and also to eliminate only the field of view and not on the sides. Okay. And if the color elimination is done properly, you will increase your resolution. If you don't do it properly, sometimes you may actually you will get more contrast. But you will see sometimes we unpropose um, or off the color elimination, but all this we can discuss if you, if you need. Okay. Just keep it in your mind, and if you think you need it, come and see us. All right, so when you do um, fluorescence microscopy, you have also a condenser, and that's actually the objective. The objective is the um, optical element, which is going to focus properly the light onto your sample. <coughs> and some settings also need to be done, but they are preset for you when we install the belts and the lights, and so you have no alignment to do. Should be optimal. Um, I want very to very quickly remind you here how the filter cubes are working. So you know that when you do fluorescence microscopy, the light comes from a different light source, and it's directed to the sample. There is excitation of the fluorescence. Fluorescence comes back to the ocular or to the camera. And how is this working? Well, first of all, we all had this at school, so I go very fast. You know that when you excite a molecule, a fluorescent molecule, it goes from a ground state to an excited state, and then it can come through different ways or path to the ground state. It can go to some intermediary states or the triplet states, uh, which are very prone to lead after to photo bleaching, for example. But the idea is that when it comes down to uh, the ground state, the energy absorbed by the photon when receiving the photon has to be released, and a fluorescent molecule will often release it as, an, uh, as a new photon but whose wavelength will be longer than uh, the wavelength of the exciting photon. All right. And what you have here is um, typical um, excitation and emission spectra for a fluorophore. Here is GFP definition, what we call the Stokes shift. The Stokes shift, you may hear of it. That's the difference between the maximum of excitation and the maximum of emission. And um, very often, it's very nice if the Stokes shift is large. Um, and uh, you will see why just right now. So this is totally trivial and basic. Um, why am I showing this to you? The reason is that I want you to, to have this clearly in mind. So wh when people speak about fluorophores, they always give the excitation max and the emission max. But as you can see here, this actually is curves tell you that you can excite the same molecule at many, many different wavelengths. It's just that it's less efficient. Okay, so the maximum of excitation, that's the most efficient way to excite the molecule. But if you look here at GFP, I can excite GFP with um, photons which are at 425 nanometers. It's very inefficient, but it works. Okay, so these spectra, these curves here, are probability curves, if you want. Uh, what's your chance to excite, to have a successful, successful excitation of your fluorophore? Same applies for the emission. Um, there is a, most of the photons will have a wavelength around, let's say, 515, but you will have also photons emitted by GFP, which will have 60 nanometer okay, as a wavelength. So I'm stressing this point because it's very important that you understand that when, even when you use filter cubes and you have a red filter cube and a green filter cube, it's absolutely possible to see GFP with a red filter cube. It just depends how much you have. Okay? Because if you have a lot, even if the, with the red filter cube, the excitation is very poor because you don't send the right photons on it, but you will excite a little bit, and you will see also a little bit. So most of the time, you don't see because you don't have too, many, too much GFP, and et cetera, and you do short exposure times, but it's possible. So this explains why in many, many experiments, we have crosstalks between the channels and the fluorophores. Um, yeah, and so you shouldn't be surprised. And it works in all directions. You can see also your green, your red dyes with your green filter cube. OK? It's very, very little. Most of the time, you don't see it, but you can. That's all I want to 
it's about this. So if we go back to the filter cube, um, it's composed of, um, of four elements. There is cube in plastic, and in it there are three optical elements. You have an excitation filter whose role is to filter the photons for the excitation. And below, in blue, I have put, um, you can see the specification of this excitation filter. How to read this graph? This is the transmission. So up to 440 nanometers, there is zero transmission, which means photons are blocked. Okay? Then between 450 and 490, it's almost 100% transmission. It means they go through. And again, after 490, the photons are blocked. So only photons whose wavelength is between 450 and 490, let's say, will go through. Okay? And these are typically the photons which have the highest chance to excite GFP in this case. They go, they bounce here onto the dichroic mirror. And in green, you see here the specifications of this mirror. Everything which is below 500 has no transmission. And that means here it's not blocked, it means it's reflected. That's why I call it a mirror. Okay, <coughs> it's not a filter. So reflected means that all the excitation photons here will come here will be reflected and will go down actually to the sample. And then all photons which are above 500 will, will go through. So it means that because of the stock shift, you excite at a given wavelength, but the emitted photons have a longer wavelength. And actually here it's nice because the dichroic mirror is just chosen that it reflects the excitation photons, but the photons emitted by GFP, whose wavelength is longer, will go through. And again, according to the same principle as the excitation filter, the emission filter, the excitation filter will also selectively let the very specific GFP-specific um, photons go through. Okay. So this is easy, and this is um, when you overlay the specifications of the filter cube to the excitation and emission spectra of GFP. And you see that actually here in this case, it's quite a good match. But as you can see, it's never perfect. So here, I'm not, with this filter, excitation filter, I'm not selecting all the photons which could optimally excite GFP. But it's on purpose, because here, actually, even if, if it's less, bit less efficient, I can put more light. Okay. So <coughs> I will manage to excite. But what I want here is to have an, an emission filter which nicely collects and let all the emission emitted photons go through because here there are very, very few. Okay? We speak of 100, 200, like 1,000 photons. So I want to catch them all to be very sensitive. Okay? And that's, what we, that's a pretty good match between a fluorophore and the filter. Okay? But you see that if the stock shift uh, was bigger, it would be a bit easier to design more optimal filters, filter cubes. All right. So we come first to the resolution. And um, one of my main take-home message is that you really understand that the resolution is not the magnification. And a good microscope is a microscope that has a good resolution power. Um, it's not a microscope that magnifies a lot. And I will show you that if you magnify too much, you may even lose your signal and your resolution. Okay, that's very important to understand. Um, there are some relations between the magnification and the resolution, but it's mainly due to the fact that um, you have limitations uh, with your um, camera, your digi digitalization of the signal. I will explain all this to you. But really resolving is, is, is very important, is more important. So you have the resolution. This is what you can achieve. And the resolving power is more or less what your instruments, in theory, allow you to do. And I can tell you that it's extremely rare that you achieve the um, resolving power of your microscope. And the main reason for this is that you work with biological samples, which um, usually have quite faint signals, and especially if they're fluorescent. And sometimes it's good, and, and this is what you want, because you don't want to overexpress your molecules. You want to have some physiological expression levels or whatsoever. And also, they are full of media, or um, you have the cytoplasm, or you have whatsoever, which are going to disturb the paths of the photons and are going anyhow to distort your image and is going to deteriorate your resolution. So the resolution you get at the end, it's the resolving power, depends on the resolving power, and what we call the contrast, um, you will see um, in your sample. And the contrast is a measure of the precision um, at which you can distinguish um, a signal from the background. I come on this again. And um, as I said, in most biological materials, um, 
<coughs> contrast is not very good. And I'll show you at the very end, again, measures about resolution on different scopes and how the contrast will influence this. So here again, because it's extremely important, if you think that this kind of objective is actually a microscope setup, and this is my object, my sample, I have two small green fluorescent elements in my sample, and here, this is the image transmitted by the microscope. Here I have no magnification, but I have a good resolution because the image which is um, projected from my sample or by the microscope is quite faithful to um, the sample itself, okay? Um, here it's not. Here I have a microscope which has a high magnification, but the resolution is poor. So I do have a very large picture. I see things very big, but it's blurred, okay? So there is no point because there is no point of magnifying if anyhow it's blurred. Because it's not because it's bigger that it gets sharper, okay? And of course you have systems where you can magnify and um, have a faithful image of your sample. So here with my very poor um, graphical uh, skills, what I've tried to do, you see that here, um, this is the image given by the microscope. And as you can see, um, I've hit a bit of haze all around, okay? So why so? It's because the image of what you get from your sample is never really truly what your sample is. It's just a kind of image of it. It's what the microscope can get out of it. Okay. And <coughs> we come to the uh, definition of the resolution. And, and you will see why I, I said that what you get is just what, it's not, it's not the truly what you have in your sample, but you try to come close. So the resolution of an optical system, that's the, the, the smallest distance um, between two uh, point sources or two extremely small objects. Okay, so that the diffraction pattern, and I will explain you what it is, show a detectable drop in intensity. So that's, that's our definition, okay? That's the resolution. Basically, it means that you start to resolve something when if you have two objects, at the point if they are further and further from each other, if they are very far away, you see two, and when they come close, at some point you can't see that you have two, you see only one, okay? But at the point where you start to see for sure that you have two, that's your resolution. That's your limit of resolution. Okay. So what's a diffraction pattern? <coughs> so if you have a fluorescent object, even if it's a very small um, point, very, very bright, um, which emits light, of course, in all directions, and the light comes into your objective, it goes through a fence, which is the entrance, the front lens, goes through the optics, and the image you get after is not a teeny dot, basically, it's always something which has some disks all around, okay? They are very faint, but you can still see them. Okay, here it's, you hardly see them here, but on purpose, because they are very, very faint, but they are there, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is, well, <coughs> and I can show you this also in 3D, so that's my dot, and if I do a Z stack, so for those who don't know, so I'm taking pictures in Z, so by moving the stage up and down, okay, and I'm taking picture. And <coughs> if I look now from the top, if I look from the side of this cube of images, this is what I see. This image is the same as this one. I just increase the contrast so that you can see the diffraction pattern better. What you get is always um, here a kind of a rugby ball with a lot of hair or, I don't know, um, patterns all around. So that's the diffraction pattern. And it's always like this, okay? And even if your sample, I mean, your object was a perfect bead, Okay, so the image of a perfect, a perfect bead is not a perfect bead, it's a kind of a rugby ball, okay, plus there is a minimum size for the signal. So if your bead is, of course, 10 microns, then you will see a big 10 micron bead. But if your bead is below, if its size is below the resolution limit of the scope, anyhow, you won't be able to determine its size. So if your bead is one angstrom, let's say, extremely small, super bright, something like extraterrestrial, with your microscope, you will see it as a rugby ball of 200 nanometers by 600 nanometers, always. So if your bead is one angstrom or 10 nanometers or 100 nanometers, in your microscope, you see always the same. You see 200 by 60 nanometers, okay? So you're limited. So you, don't, you can't know the size of your very small particle, okay? So this is because of this... Um, diffraction patterns and the diffraction that occurs in the system. Um, okay, so now this pattern, this diffraction pattern, you can model it mathematically. 
and you can fit it with a function, and it's called the point spread function. And the point spread function so describes the response of an imaging uh, system to a point source or a point object. Okay. I have two more slides on theory. You will see why I'm telling you all this, and, and then we'll go to very, very practical um, um, considerations, but this is going to be very practical very soon. Okay, this is just pseudo colors so that you see better the diffraction pattern. And again, it's to remind you, so the definition, the diffraction patterns, you know what it is now. Okay, this is this thing. Um, <coughs> and then you want to see a um, detectable drop in intensity between the two objects, like here. All right? So you already understand from what I told you that if you have two objects, let's say they are each of them 10 nanometers, and you have one, then 10 nanometers, the other one, you cannot distinguish them. Because 10 nanometers, the image will be 200, the other, the other one also, also, so they will be like some kind of fat images and they will melt together and you won't be able to see them. So how far should be from each other so that you can really say that you have two objects? So well, they need to, you want to see basically a drop in the intensity between the two, you say, ah, I start to see that I have two, two things here, all right? So again, this is um, this diffraction pattern. And if you draw a line um, across this point and you look at the intensities along this line, you see um, nicely here this curve. You can fit it with uh, special functions, but um, this main spot is often fitted also with the Gaussian curve. It's a very good approximation. But um, further away, you see that you have also the other small called airy disks, okay, um, which um, are faint but are here. All right. So finally, this contrast and why am I telling you all this and these curves and these diffraction patterns? All right. So there are different criteria to say when do you have a drop in intensity, when, when it's good enough to say you have two objects, but there is the relay criterion which says that the contrast in an image when it's 26.4% as the resolution. So what Relight say, says us is that if here the drop in intensity is 26.4% uh, compared to the signal, then I can consider, I can start to consider that I have two objects and the, the limit of the resolution. So you of, of course don't have to remember that number, you don't care. What's important here is the following. This 26.4% drop of intensity occurs when here the point spread function of the object number two and the maximum of this point spread function sits exactly on top of the first minimum of the other point spread function, okay? And why is this, why is that, so what? Okay. So then it means that if you make an image of a bead and you measure the intensity along, um, across this bead, for example, which is very easy to do, you know, with whatever software you use, you take your picture, you draw a line and you say plot intensities along this line, okay? Then you can get this curve. And if you measure the distance between the maximum or the center of this bead to the first minimum, then you have the resolution of your scope, okay? So the, my point here, where I want to come, is that it's very easy to determine the resolution of your system. You can take bits, I mean, you can buy them, they are quite cheap, actually. Small bits whose size is below the resolution of the scope. You put them between um, slide and cover slip, and you go to the scope, you make a picture, you can make a Z stack if you want to have the resolution in Z, the axial resolution. Otherwise, you just make one plane for the lateral resolution, and you just measure the distance between the max or the center of this bit to the first minimum, and you know the resolution of your scope, okay? <coughs> So you don't need to do it really you. I mean, we have uh, also some more here. We have some uh, student jobs at FAME. We have people who um, maintain the microscopes every week and part of their job is every week with such bits to check the resolution of the scope because if the resolution decreases or if the point spread function starts to have a weird shape, it means there is um, a damage on the objective or there is a problem with the system. And so every week, on all the high-end systems, on all the objectives at FAME, we do three point spread function for every objective to check the quality of the systems. So it's quick, and if you want to try it by yourself, you can also do it if you want, or if you suspect a problem, we can always show you how to do, okay? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, <coughs> So that's empirically how you can determine the um, magnification. So of course there are formula to, to more theory to really calculate this resolution. 
and uh, different ones um, depending if you do wide field or confocal microscopy. But globally, um, it looks like this. The resolution is in XY. This 1.22 measured uh, multiplied by the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture of the objective plus that of the condenser. So I will give you right after the definition of the, numer um, of the numerical aperture. Um, in the case of fluorescence, as I told you, the objective is the condenser. So this and that are the same. So the formula boils down to this, 0.61 multiplied by the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture. <coughs> and the, what is very important here to see is that there is no mention of magnification. Okay. The resolution power of your system has nothing to do with the magnification. That's all. And because um, I told you that in Z, you get um, a different shape, and we do the image of a bead is not a bead, it's a kind of a rugby ball. Of course, the definition and the formula for the resolution, the axial resolution is different. But again, it's lambda multiplied by the refractive index. I will tell you again, well, I'll remind you what, what it is, divided by the numerical aperture to the square. And you see again, there is nothing about magnification. There's nothing to do to this magnification. Um, yes. So typically for an objective like a 100x objective, 1.4 NA, this is, this is the NA. This is this number, which you will see always on the objectives after the magnification. You always have magnification slash NA, okay? Um, if you work something like greenish light, your resolution will be 226 nanometers. So any object work closer than 226 nanometers, you won't see them. I mean, you, you, won't be able to, you will see them, sorry, but you won't be able to distinguish whether you have one or two, okay? The other thing is that you see that it depends on the wavelength. So if you use um, blue light, you will be you would have a higher resolution than if you lose, use far red light, all right? And it's because um, when you use um, your blue light, R is smaller, so the point spread function is thinner, so of course the object can be closer and you can still see them. If you use red light, the point spread function is like fat or larger, okay? So you need to have them further apart from each other to be able to see this drop in intensity, okay? So we saw that beside wavelength, very important parameter is numerical aperture. So the numerical aperture of an objective, that's again the slide with definition, the NA, is N, N is the refractive index of the medium, multiplied by sinus mu, and mu is this um, angle here, the angle of the cone of light collected by the objective, okay? So um, N is the refractive index, and um, I don't know if you know, but the refractive index, or if you remember many, refractive index of air is one, refractive index of oil or glass is 1.51. So uh, the higher the N, the higher will be the resulting power of your system. So now we go on, um, before I go on, I don't want to confuse you, but actually the resulting power has nothing to do with the magnification, but the magnification can play a role in your final resolution, okay, for that reason. So let's imagine now that I have an, um, a microscope which is magnifying and uh, with a good resolution, all right? So this is my signal, and this is, let's say, the chip of my camera, and you see that this signal, this image, is going to, or the photons here, are going to fall down here in three pixels. And this is the image you will have you won't be able to see. I mean, the, the microscope gives a very nice and faithful image of what's in the sample, but because of your camera, because here the pixels are, let's say, too big, you don't see it. So then you have two options if you really want need to see it and to document it. Either you decrease pixel size, and this is what is very easy to do on, for, on a confocal microscope, typical LSM. You know that you can change the scan. They say it's called frame size, but it's Instead of scanning with 512 by 512 pixels, you can scan with 1024 by 1024. For the same field of view, you have much more pixels, so it means each pixel is much smaller, and then you have a better, what we call sampling, I will come back on so on this, of um, your, your signal, and then you can see it. If you work with a wide field system and a camera, of course you cannot change the pixels on the camera, and this is where you could try to use a higher magnification and the goal is to have still a nice signal, but that the signal 
corresponding to these two dots fall further apart on the chip of the camera. Okay? And then you will see them again. Okay? <coughs> this is where, of course, the magnification can play a role. I will come back on this also because sometimes it's not, it's not intuitive. I mean, this is very easy to understand, but I will give you a couple of application examples where it's not always trivial if really you should go for a higher magnification. Uh, <coughs> one danger, and this is what I've seen very often, um, is that you want to go to, you want to have a better resolution, and uh, so people switch from the, let's say, 40x to the 100x to see better, okay? What you have to realize is that when you switch to the 40x to the 100x, you're going to lose some signal, because if the 40x and the 100x have more or less the same NA, so typically the 40x have globally 1.3 1 and the 100x 1.4. So that means that they globally collect more or less the same amount of light. All right. But the 40x is going to send the signal over a given region of the chip, and the 100x, because it magnifies more, this very same signal is going to spread, spread it out over the whole chip, let's say, okay, of the camera. So that means that the same amount of photons would be spread over much more many um, uh, pixels. So it means that each pixel will receive much less photons. And in the case of your biological samples, you have very few photons. So you start to spread out some things all over to the point where actually you're going to lose some signal and some contrast. And <coughs> the, the brightness of your image varies globally with the fourth power of DNA, but um, as inverse, inversely as to, to the square of the magnification. So <coughs> this is a theoretical small calculation. If, let's say, if this is the brightness you get with the 5x 0.15 objective. This is what you get with the 20x 0.8. Okay. This is what you get with the 40x 1.3. So the 40x 1.3 objective is very, very bright because it's a very nice combination and it's a uh, trade-off between DNA and the magnification. So you collect a lot of light and you don't spread it too much on your detector. Okay. And you see here <coughs> 100x 1.3 NF, for example, you lose 80% of the brightness, okay? So <coughs> if you have a very, very good signal, you don't care because you have a very good signal, you use your 100x, and you're in the case I just showed before that the signal gets a bit better separated and you will see better and you will indeed increase your resolution. But just keep in mind that if your signal is anyhow weak and you say, ah, oh, I want to see better, if you go to a higher magnification, it will be even weaker, so it will be worse, okay? It's not going to improve anything. The other thing here which is important to understand is the following. <coughs> <coughs> you will see that on all, all the confocals, we have 63x objectives, but we never have 100x objectives, okay? So why? The reason is the following. 100x objectives usually have the very same NA as the 63x, so they do not collect more light. You may want to have them on a wide field system because you want to spread the light over, but on a confocal microscope, because you can define the pixel size and the sampling, if you want to have a 100x-like magnification, you take a 63x and you do a zoom of 1.6. It's the very same as using a 100x. Okay, the 100x is not going to bring anything more. The advantage of having a 63x is that if you don't want to zoom in, you get a bigger field of view for the same price, okay? And if you want to zoom in, you just zoom in, okay? It's the very same. So there is no reason why we should have a 63x and a 100x on the confocal microscope. Okay. Right. So now let's say, let, let's stay on the confocal, and let's say now we have a 20x. So I told you if you have a 63x, a zoom 1.6, it's just like the 100x. But be careful, it's not true with the 20 and the 40x. Because if you use the 20x 0.8 and you, do, and you zoom by 2, you get a 40x magnification. That's true, and maybe you're happy with it, and maybe the pixel size is still fine because you can still resolve more things, okay? But it's not the same. You can do that for many reasons. Also because you want to have an air objective. We'll speak about working distance after. You can go deeper in the specimen with your 20x or whatsoever. But it's not the same as to turn on to the 40x objective. Because usually, typically, especially on all confocals, if you turn to the 40x 1.3, this is an oil objective. The NA you see is much higher. And suddenly you go to a system where the resulting, resulting power is much higher. So if you do 20x zoom 2, zoom by 2, if you change to the 40x, suddenly your image will be much brighter 
and the achievable resolution will be also much higher. So it's not the same, okay? Okay, so that was um, super basic concepts and definitions. <coughs> we go on now and speak about uh, different aberrations and, and problems. So we saw that in the definition of the numerical aperture, there was this small n, which is the refractive index. So we all had this at school, okay, and you know that's the experiment where you put a, a stick into water, it looks like broken, okay, that's um, because of the change in refractive index of the two media, and you know this formula, and it's a very easy mathematics. Basically, it's very easy to describe the uh, trajectory of light, uh, refractive index um, of medium one, multiplied by the sinus of alpha one is equal to the refractive index of medium two multiplied by sinus alpha two, and you can know what are the angles very easily because you know the refraction of the refractive indexes um, of your media. So this is, well, this is even so at school when we're at this. Just to uh, remind you what are the refractive index we every, in, every, you know, every day life we deal with as a biologist. So air is one, water is 1.33, glycerol is 1.46, uh, you know you have also glycerol immersion objectives, and oil is 1.51, okay? So with oil, you see it's very nice because it's the very same as glass. So when you put your objective and some oil and a cover slip, for the light, it's just like one element. It is no difference. Okay, so provided the room temperature is okay, okay, because the, uh, the, the refractive index of, of the oil changes with the temperature and they're optimized so that you work in at 22. This is why the microscopy rooms are at 22 degrees plus minus one, okay. All right, so it's nice. Um, why, so why don't we use them always? You will see why. It's not always better to use an oil objective, only sometimes. What's the refractive index of your specimen? We'll discuss this, it's not very clear, we don't know. Okay, but let's see first the advantages of the oil objective and the oil immersion. So let's imagine you have here um, a sample and you have something fluorescent, uh, your element very close to the cover slip it emits light in all direction. And you see, for example, this tray of light here will go through, um, will go through the color slip, the oil, it will be captured by your objective and your system, and it will go and onto your camera. If you were using air, here at the interface between glass and air, because an of air is smaller, you have a deviation, and this is get lost, okay? So you see that here when you put oil, you collect more photons than if you were using here air, okay? And so explain so why DNA is higher, okay? So it's nice, and the higher the uh, number of photons and the higher the DNA, the higher the resolution, so you say, well, that's very nice. Let's use an oil objective, okay? It's true, but it's not always true. So first, let's imagine now you're imagining not something very close to the cover slip, but like deeper, okay? You have a thick sample, let's say you have, say, elegance, and you have a label, some cells like below of your, of your worm or whatever. So it can be like something like 50, 100 microns, 200 microns or more away from the cover slip. So what happens? Here, your objective, your objective is here. The light goes in this direction, okay? And at the interface between water and glass and oil whatsoever, change in direction. This time, Na is higher, so it doesn't go away, it goes more to the inside, and it's captured by the system. So you say, well, it's fine, it's captured by the system. Yes, but the problem is that it enters the system with a given direction, which makes you believe that the signal comes from much deeper. And this has two consequences. First of all, your image will look very distorted, and the deeper you will go, the more the architecture will be wrong. So you will see something, but the distances between the different objects will be always more and more wrong as you go deep, okay? So if you are looking at uh, morphological uh, uh, um, features in your specimen, you can make very big errors, okay? The second problem is, if you imagine this is a small, infinitely small dot, so you get a point spread function, okay? And as you can see here, the point spread function gets even more elongated if you have this, what we call the refractive index mismatch, which means that the refractive index of your a sample is not the same as your mounting, um, as your uh, immersion medium. 
Um, so the principal function gets always more and more elongated. Okay, it looks not like a, not even a rugby ball. It can be like a, a needle. Okay, and you work with a contour pole and you close the pinhole because you want to have a nice resolution. So what happens is that with the pinhole you are going to cut all the signal, not coming from exactly the focal plane. I will explain you this again after. So basically you lose all your signal. So not only the the morphological features are wrong, but you just lose signal, okay, when you think, so when you say, well, I've used oil, I mean, I'm super sensitive, and then I should see, if I don't see it with oil, I won't see it with anything else, it's not true. And that's exactly the opposite here, this is an example, images are a bit faint, but you can still see that this image here, I get more signal than there, and um, these are images of the same sample, this is here with a 63x objective, here also, here the NA is even lower, 1.2, than this one, which was 1.3. But here, this is a glycerol immersion objective, and here it's a water immersion objective. And because my sample here was mostly in water, very accurate sample, you see here that I get much nicer pictures of this very thick sample if I use the right immersion medium. Uh, so basically, it means an immersion medium that whose refractive index matches the one of my mounting medium. Okay. So you see, it's not always because you use oil, that you will get more signal, or that your images will be better. Okay. So now, I would say, as a rule of thumb, I would say oil is always better if you look at something close to the cover slip, like up to 10 microns. Um, most of the time, you get small distortions, but you get so many distortions from so many things, also from the, the Golgi, the whatsoever. So uh, most of the time, it's still much nicer. If you need to go deeper, then you have to think, and it depends on each sample. But then, as soon as you go deeper than 10 to 20 microns, it's a good idea to try to think twice about what you want to do, and whether you should not maybe change the objective, go for maybe slightly, slightly lower NA, but have a good match of your immersion medium and your mounting medium. Okay. <laughs> All right. So refractive index mismatch can be a problem to get nice pictures and good resolution. The other problems, you have to face also chromatic aberrations. So the refractive index um, is going to, of your system, actually depends also on the wavelength. And depending on the wavelength, it means that your signal will be focused at different positions. So let's say you have a perfect uh, colocalization, uh, or you have a, um, an element which is staying in green and red, because, you know, but what you will see, you will see one object green, one object red, because of chromatic aberration. Also because your lasers, if you don't use a system which is nicely aligned or corrected, the green laser and the red laser on your confocal, going through the very same objective, will focus the different position. So if you first image green and then red, you will think that you have imaged two different things, okay? Because the stage will need to move at different focus to catch this object, all right? So of course, it's uh, not good. And of course, the objectives usually are corrected for this. So the manufacturers put more glass lenses inside to try to correct this effect, and you have different um, grades of correction. You have the so-called achromatic objective, the neoflare objectives, and the apochromatic objectives. So the best corrected ones are the apochromatic objectives, and most of the objectives on the facility are apochromatic ones. Of course, it comes at, a pr it comes at two prices. First, the uh, price. It's much more expensive. Okay. Second, because of all these corrections, you lose a bit of light. Okay, so this is why, on, for example, on the confocal microscopes, the 40x objectives are neoflare objectives because, as I told you, this is a very good combination to get very bright signal, 40x, 1.3, and so we, we thought, okay, we stick to objectives which are very, very bright, don't eat any light, so that gives you a condition where you can, be, can try to be super, super sensitive while having a high resolution, okay. But most of the time, I mean, all the reverse objectives usually we buy only apochromatic objectives. So this is an example on one of the LSM 700 on the facility. I have one bead, which has multicolor, multi dyes in it. It's only one object. And <coughs> I excite with the 48 or the 555, green and red. And this is what I get um, in XY plane, and this is uh, the axial resolution. So it's pretty much well aligned, okay? But if I use now the 405 laser and the 555 laser, you see that it's not well corrected in XY. Plus, I have a big shift here in X, Y, Z. And it's still the same object. But I have the feeling I have two objects, okay? 
So if you use the 63x1.4, which is a plannable chromat objective, it's, um, there is a much better fit between the different colors, but still it's not perfect. Uh, especially if you use fluor 5 or UV light, um, the correction is not perfect. You may see two small objects. So the message here is that first, if you need to do super precise color localization experiments, you want to see whether these dots or this uh, neurotransmitter at the tip of that neuron or spines is just like the same as this one, don't use the 40x objective. Okay. Use rather the 63, or if for some reasons, and anyhow in both cases, you can use also the 40x, but even more with the 40x, you need to um, calibrate or need to know what's this shift. And this is possible, we can give you some bits like these ones. You make first one picture of these bits, then you see what's the shift between the different channels. And after we have some software, and this is done in routine uh, among our users, you can correct the images you have knowing the shift, you reshift everything back. Okay, and after you can try to see whether you have co-localization or not. All right. Other problems, other small de defaults in the system that are going to make uh, that you may not have the nice pictures or the resolution you want to achieve, these are the spherical aberrations. And basically, they arise from the fact that uh, the rays crossing, for example, here systems on the border will also be focused on a different position than those which go straight through the center. And you can see this easily if you put a grid, um, a small sample, and with a grid on it under the microscope, and you look through the ocular, it will look like a basket. Okay, this is typical. Okay. So again, of course, you can correct for this, put additional lenses, and um, this is what the prefix plan means when you have plan means uh, when you have an objective. So at FST, we have many plan apochromatic objectives which means they are corrected both for spherical and chromatic aberrations. Okay. We never have non-plan objectives, but uh, they're also more expensive. Okay. You don't need to have a plan if you just have a small objective in a cell culture lab and you want to look at your cells quickly in bright field. Okay. You don't need to spend money too much on this. But if you want to do high-end microscopy, you need. Okay. Two small things here <coughs> before the next chapter. Shading correction. So whatever you do when you go in the system, even if it's perfectly aligned, and you put um, a sample, and let's say you put a uniform um, slide with fluorescence, and fluorescence is spread totally uniformly on the slide, you won't see a flat signal. You will see something like this. This is just pseudo-colored. You will see that the intensity in the center is higher than on the side. And it's absolutely normal, even with a brand new objective. The, the first time I measured this, I was scared. I didn't know it was existing. And I was asked uh, when I arrived to test some objectives. And, and I saw 20% drop of intensity of the signal on the, on the side of the image. And actually, that's perfectly normal. I called size. I said, yeah, that's the specifications. You lose 20% of the signal on the side of the image. Okay? So you can correct for this first because it doesn't look nice. Second, I will show you it can have a tremendous impact when you do my, uh, quantifications. You can do um, a reference picture. And then so you know if it's fully flat, so I can give you a sample where it's the signal is very flat. And then you take a picture of it. You see how much it decreases. And then you can correct all your images after. It's very easy in batch. So to correct for this shading. That's called the shading correction. And that's very important if you want to be quantitative. So you see here, um, these are two pictures taken from a sample that a user once gave me. And um, can you say which one is shading, shading corrected and not and which is the raw image? If you don't say it's right, it doesn't matter, but uh, what's, what's your guess? Sorry? No, that's the opposite. OK? Because you see here in the corner, it's brighter. So it means here I had some shading. It gets darker. But if I correct it, actually, I have more signal than I think. OK, here it looks dark. It's not that dark. It's just because of the shading. It just I collect less signal. So once I've corrected it, this is what I get. OK? And don't worry, everybody always answer, gives the wrong answer to this question. <laughs> Every course. <laughs> OK, that's good. Um, OK, so now let's imagine I want to do some quantifications. And um, so this has no scientific, what I did, this quantification has no meaning. It's just, just to show you, OK? Uh, I mean, no uh, scientific, no biological meaning. So let's imagine I want to know ah, what's the intensity or how much is my 
protein is expressed in this kind of small structure compared to something there. Okay. So I make a region of interest, Roy1, Roy2. I draw the background and I measure Roy1 minus background and I compare to Roy2 minus background. Okay. And you see that if I do a shading correction, I see a ratio of 3. If I do no shading correction, I see a ratio of almost 6. Okay. So if you want to do some quantitative imaging in fluorescence, you cannot escape the shading correction. Or another option is that you only quantify what is in the very center of your field of view. So because with the shading, if you put the very same cell at the center, or if you put it just at the border and you measure it, here you will have 100, here you will have 80. And, for, and I know, for example, some of you like on the confocals to have a big field of view because you know, so they do zoom 0.6 or 0.5. It's even worse. It's a disaster because the same cell in the center gives you a signal of 100. And if the same cell would be just at the border, you would get 60. So, of course, if you look at differences between different samples and you expect a tenfold increase, you don't care because you will be a bit of noise. Okay. But if you want to see subtle differences, you won't see them anymore. You, you will be imprecise. Okay. So um, there are different ways to, to, to correct for uh, these shadings. Uh, this I'll, I'll go fast on this one. Um, we can give, provide you different slides or fluorescent solutions. Um, this is actually the best. But you see here with a zoom of 0.6, if you compare CFP and YFP um, on the confocal, there is a huge difference because this shading is also wavelength specific. So for people who do ratio imaging, like some fret imaging, uh, ratio imaging, and you divide always your signal in the YFP channel by the CFP channel or acceptor channel by donor channel, you see here, if the cell sits in the center, you will say, well, I have no fret. But if your cell is just um, at the border of the image, you say, wow, I have a lot of fret. Okay. So be very careful. Any quantitative imaging, um, should take into account this um, shading. Okay. So on the confocals, what I've seen is that if you work then with a zoom of 1.5 or 2, you still have some shading. But for most of the project, it's, a, it's minimal, and you can work with it. So it's not a problem anymore. If you work on a bright field system or a camera-based system, you can always crop and just use the center. If, I mean, if you don't want to do the shading correction, because sometimes it's not easy to do a shading correction because, of course, your sample has some properties, some medium, and the test the reference slide that you take for this is not exactly the same. So you may get a slightly different shading in your reference slide and in your sample. So sometimes you don't correct, but then you need to concentrate just on the region where it's minimal. OK. OK. <coughs> and more or less to finish up with these um, problems of uh, small aberrations, um, the white balance, so we are here just back to the uh, transmitted light uh, microscopy I um, spoke about at the very beginning. <coughs> I just mentioned because I've seen too many people not doing the white balance correction. One actually is very easy. So it happens, this it happened to me. I went once to a scope, and this is the picture I got. It was very bluish um, <coughs> because the camera, wi the white balance was not set properly. And this it was a bit better, it was yellowish. Or you see here, even if it looks nice, I mean, it should be very white where you have no uh, sample, it should be very white. So when you go to the scope and then you say live, and then you see your picture, if the empty positions do not look really, really white, uh, you should do a white balance. It takes 30 seconds. Usually, just you go to the software, you say click white balance, you say this should be white, bam, it's done, okay? Super easy. And it will improve tremendously the quality of your pictures. And I always think that, <coughs> I mean, this topic. This experiment that was some staining from um, organs from mice, so it took time to to write the grant and then to get the grant and to order the mice and to design the experiment and to perform the experiments and to kill the mice and to stain the samples, and you come to the scope, and instead of doing a 30 second uh, small operation of white balance, they ruin the whole six months of experiments and work and get the bad picture of what was a tremendous effort to get to that point. Okay, so. Color elimination and white balance can really make a big difference. And just think of them, and we're happy to help you, but just do them. Not, don't, don't try to save two minutes at the beginning, because you're going to spoil six months of work. OK, okay. <coughs> so finally, we saw um, in this chapter, so now you know, I mean, you knew already how to read or to find the magnification and objective. Now you know that um, another important factor even sometimes more important, is DNA. 
and this is always that number after the slash, after the magnification, okay? Um, you know that we have, as here it's a few objective, but usually we have plan apochromat objective, so now you understand why on the objective you see plan apochromat 63x slash 1.4, so all this now you understand. The last thing you may want to understand on the objective is this number. Um, so sometimes it says WD before, sometimes it's just like this, you need to know, depending on the brain of the scope, so different places, or and that's a working distance. And basically, the working distance tells you how deep you can go into your specimen, okay? And unfortunately, the working distance tends to, I mean, decreases with the, as the magnification of DNA go high. So the working distance of oil objectives is very limited, and the working distance of the oil objectives are 170 microns. Okay. So you see, if you cut uh, an organ and it's 200 micron, you will never ever be able to image it through with um, 100x to 1.4 objective, okay? So for this, you need to go to a lower NA objective, which have a longer working distance, but DNA is lower, so you won't be as sensitive. So it's always a trade-off, and then when you do these experiments, you always have to try to find some optimal. And of course, you can come to us and we can discuss it if it's an issue, okay? You see also that the working distance of this oil objective is very small, so if you go, I have a lot of people, they, they, I mean, it's not their fault, it's not a critic, but um, it's, it's difficult. Let's say you have some, some people who have worms, or, and they mount them on, on agar pads, and then it's very acute. There is a lot of uh, medium all around, so they put the carpet slip. If you don't press well, of course, you don't want to press too much because you're going to squeeze your worm, okay? But if you don't press well or remove the excess of water, it's very easy to have a small film of 100 micron of water on top of your worm, you see? And you lose already two-thirds of your working distance. You would never ever be able, sometimes you don't even see your worm, it's just too far. This is because you have a bit too much of medium on the top, okay? Okay, so now we are going to go back on, first and back, so I'll give you more definitions, especially related to the f to digital digitalization of the images, and we'll go with forth and back to see how is going to this is going to uh, influence your resolution, because that's always the very important criterion, and your sensitivity. All right, <coughs> so, so you know that we, don't use Kodak film anymore to make a picture of the samples. We have digital instruments. So we digitalize an analog signal. And <coughs> when doing so, there are two um, things which are important. So first you sample um, your, your, your signal and you have a um, given resolution given by the, the size of the pixels. And also the intensity in each pixel is encoded with a number. And also this number can be more or less precise, okay? So the number of pixels and the range of brightness values, and you will see this is what we call the bit depth, are going to impact also your final um, quality, your final resolution. And this is what we're going to discuss it. And <coughs> again, um, I already mentioned it several times, but here I will really again discuss and, 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 and try to answer the question, what's the resolution between pixel size, resolution, noise, and contrast, okay? And is it true that the resolution improves when you decrease pixel size, so meaning when you increase res your magnification, for example. Okay, so let's imagine here the green is my analog signal. And I'm going to digitalize it. So I get my pixels, and this is what I get after digitalization. So you see here that I can still see my two objects or my, my shape, okay? So it's fine. And of course, the bigger here the pixels get, the less I see the details. So here I can still guess that I have this shape or these two objects, and here I lose my resolution. So here very intuitively, so yeah, of course, if the pixels are very small and you sample very fine, uh, you get a better resolution. And this is true. I'm not going to say the opposite, but it's true to a certain limit. And the limit is reached very easily if you work with biological samples. This is why I'm insisting here. Okay, so here you have no contrast, here still a little bit of contrast, and here higher contrast. Okay. <coughs> First, um, because we speak of, about pixel size, um, I show you these images. I scanned a sample for staying with tubulin, I think. Um, these are mammalian cells, and here you can see the, um, where the nucleus is, okay? But whatever, I, I make these pictures, and I scan them 250 by 250 pixels on the confocal microscopes, and then I decrease 
125, 135, 62, 62, 31, 31. All right. So I think we all agree on the fact that this is awful and you don't see anything. This here is not nice. Okay, I agree. But if your question is, let's say, do I have these uh, filaments inside or below the nucleus? Well, you can pretty, you can answer here. I mean, here the construction is good, but here you can say yes. You get the answer, okay? Of course, you may want to go there because it's a bit still nicer. You're sure you're not, it's here it's a bit blurred. You, you want to be sure that of what you see, okay? But basically here, doesn't, this doesn't give a better answer to your question than this, okay? So why I'm saying this? <coughs> because unfortunately, I have seen that people on the comfort call, I mean some people, are usually doing their settings in a way that they get nice pictures. Okay, and understand, and it's natural, fancy. Okay, but it's a very bad idea because here you see to make such a picture, uh, the number of pixels is four times higher. So four times higher, it means you will need four times more time to scan. Okay. And the pictures will be four times bigger. So we need more time to transfer them to your M drive, let's say. And also they will take much more space in memory. And then you may get into troubles when you do image processing. Plus, it takes at least four times more time because if the pixels are smaller, you get much less photons per pixel. So you need to do some averaging or to expose longer. Okay. So instead of um, going to the scope in the morning, you make your pictures from eight to 10, done, you go back to the lab, you, you run a gel or whatsoever. Here you spend eight hours and you cannot spend eight hours in the control call, so the facility during that time is limited to three hours. So you need to book from 3 p.m. to midnight if you want to be able to do this picture, okay? So not only it's not going to improve the, the answer to your scientific question, it's just going to make your life worse, all right? So <coughs> I already mentioned that um, when you get um, smaller pixels, you get less photons. <coughs> and on top of this, you will have the problem of the noise. So now I'm just going to give you some definitions. Um, so you know what the noise is. It's something, a signal, which is undesirable and it comes from different components or, or, or phenomena. And there are mainly three ones which you will take into consideration. That's the photon noise. Some people call it the shot noise, the read noise, and the dark noise. So I have one slide for each of them. The photon noise. So the photon noise is due to the fact that when you work with fluorescence, if you want to describe the arrival of the fluorophores onto your uh, detector, it's a, it's a rare event. And actually it's best described with uh, Poisson law. And um, when you illuminate a sample at a given position, um, you won't get, if you make two, consecu two consecutive images, you won't get each time exactly for the same exposure time, exactly the same number of photons, okay? The, the probability depends how well you excited your molecule, what comes through, whatsoever, the emission. So it's all this actually, because it's so little, it's submitted to some statistic laws. And um, you can describe it with, uh, with Poisson statistics. And it says that your noise is actually, in, a stat in the Poisson statistics, is the square root of your signal. So that means basically that if you eliminate, and again, Let's say once you will get 100 photons, next time 95, next time 110, next time whatsoever, okay? So and you have some noise, so which is actually the, because you don't get exactly the same number of photons. So how can you deal with this? I plotted here, let's say if in green, in, in, in white, sorry, here you have the, the signal. In um, orange, that's the square root of that signal, okay? And in green, this is the percentage that the orange signal represents compared to the white signal. So what does that mean? It means that if you go, the higher the number of photons you collect, the less this noise will be in percent important or annoying, okay? So if you collect 100 photons, the noise will be 10, so it's 10%. If you collect 10,000 photons, the noise will be 100, so it will be 1%. So it, intuitively, that means very clearly that if you increase exposure time to get more photons, you will get less noise. And that's the way to deal with short noise, okay? If the signal is very weak, you do it absolutely intuitively, you increase exposure time. Or if you work on a confocal microscope, you usually do averaging. It's the same because you go four times through the pixels, so basically you, more, you make four 
measurements, and you smooth your noise by increasing the number of measurements, okay, and the number of photons collected. So this is easy. So now there is the dark noise, and the dark noise comes from the fact that your camera chip is made of a material which is going to convert the photons to electrons upon arrival and um, when they upon collision. But also, if it's because of the heat, it's going to generate also spontaneously some electrons, which has nothing to do with photons coming. Okay. So the way to deal with this is to cool it down. And um, this is why most of the CCD cameras, the scientific ones, are cooled CCD, cooled charge devices. Because as you can see here, if you cool down to minus 30 degrees, for example, your chip will generate less than 1.5 or 1.0.2 photons per pixel and per second. So it means that um, if you make an exposure of five seconds, maybe you will have one electron due to the darkness. So this is very negligible. And um, usually, it's not a problem. Um, this is why, with one or two exceptions, all our cameras are cooled. Um, the very, very sensitive cameras on the spinning disks, which are EMCCD cameras, so electron multiplying cameras, they are cooled even to minus 80 degrees. So. Of course, these cameras are more expensive than the others. OK. And finally, there is the read noise. So <coughs> when the photons come onto a chip of the camera, there are different ways to read. This is just one example, but I give it to you because we have many systems equipped with this kind of cameras. We have, so EMCCD cameras means electron multiplying cameras. These are CCD cameras, but before the signal is read, it's amplified. And um, they work with the so-called uh, system of frame transfer, which means that once the acquisition is finished, the whole chip is transferred to a storage location where every pixel is going to be quantified while the next acquisition can start. It's a way to be much faster. Otherwise, you need to wait that the chip has been read to start the next uh, image, and it takes time. Because in those systems, pixels are read one by one of each after the other one. So they go down, they move, and then here um, th there is a small um, analog to digital converter, which is going to say how much it is here in that pixel. Okay, and this reading here creates noise, so it makes errors. Okay, so mm, there is plus minus twenty photons. Okay, so you can do too much about this. You can buy very good cameras where the read noise is very low, and all the companies work very hard on making always new models where always the read noise is lower and lower and lower. Another, what you could do as a user, some cameras have different options about the speed at which, of, at which you want to read the, the chip. So you will see on some systems, like the turf system or the spinning disk, you can choose between 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz. And um, if you go for a lower speed, you will generate less noise. Okay. But of course, you won't be able to make a super fast time lapse, let's say. Okay. So there is always a trade-off, but you could influence it a little bit. OK, so <coughs> the signal-to-noise ratio, we spoke about noise, and then you very often you will have a signal-to-noise ratio. There are different definitions, but that's, of course, the ratio between the signal and the noise. And the noise is the sum of all the type of noises. Um, here you have the square root of the sum of the squares of the read noise, the dark noise, and the shot noise. Okay. So <coughs> now, if you take um, an ideal um, camera, it, it's a camera where you have no read noise, and no dark noise. And that's, that's a perfect instrument. Shot noise, you cannot avoid. It will always be there. Okay? So here it's a logarithmic scale. The signal to noise ratio of the perfect camera will be here. This is this dotted line. Okay? And um, <coughs> this is um, the one from a CCD camera. And you see that the CCD camera, you, you have a big, big deterioration of the signal to noise ratio if you go to a regime where you have very, very few photons. It's because here the shot noise is not very high because you know you have the four photons, so square root is two, so it's so easy. But the dark noise and the red noise are much more important because here if you have five and here you have like two compared to the two to the four here, it starts to be a lot. Okay, that's why the signal to noise ratio gets bad. This is why in that case you want to use the EMCCD camera, and this is what we have on the spinning disk one, spinning disk two, and uh, the turf systems. Um, because here you see we keep very close to the perfect situation. And this is due to the fact that before the signal is read in the MCD camera, it is multiplied. So your signal, which was very few, 
gets multiplied 1,000 times or whatever. So after the read noise, the few photons which come from the read noise or the um, dark noise are again negligible. Okay. But if you go to a regime, and <coughs> of course it comes at a price, so these EMC CDs are very, very sensitive. We can detect one photon. Um, but each of these cameras is something that, you know, 45,000 Swiss francs. Okay, so you can put them everywhere. And so it's not a good idea to put them everywhere anyhow, because if you go to, if, let's say if you have a nice sample and we have a good signal, you see that after a given point, the CCD camera is going to outcompete the EMCCD camera. Okay? And this is because the amplification in the MCCD also creates noise. So you see something, but uh, it's noisy. It's more noisy than the CCD camera. This is why, <coughs> on top of the fact that they're very expensive and you cannot equip everything with the MCCD, anyhow, it's not, it's not a good idea to always go for the MCCD camera. Okay. <coughs> so the noise is really annoying because, um, let's imagine here you have these two small bits. And also, I want to see my resolution or to, to calculate distance. Here, if I look at the intensity along this yellow line, I see a significant drop uh, in intensity between the two, so I can resolve them. If I have noise, <coughs> I don't see it anymore. I cannot prove, I mean, if I know I have only two bits, I can guess, but um, I cannot prove it, you see? So that's really annoying. <coughs> and now I'm just like, with this discussion on noise, coming back on my first considerations about resolution and pixel size and sensitivity. So you start to see that the problem is that you have noise, and that's going to interfere, of course, with your signal, which is anyhow very weak. So everything you do which is going to make the signal even weaker will be a problem. Small pixels, because you increase magnification, for example, uh, that's going to be a problem. So one uh, way to get back some signal is to, do, to have big pixels. So on the LSMs, it's very easy. If you scan like 1024 by 1024 and the images are very noisy, etc., ask yourself whether you cannot scan 512 by 512. Sure, the pictures look more pixelated, but you, you may increase tremendously your contrast, and at the end, you will gain first a lot of time, and, but also a lot of signal. When you work on a camera, you cannot change the size of the pixels like this. But what you can do is a cooperation called binning, and all our systems which have a camera can do binning. It's, you need to know where it is. It's a small option. You say click, yes. And a binning is just that pixels are grouped together to make some like artificial or, or uh, say, um, big pixels. Um, so you see here, this is my, again my microscope. This is the image of my sample. The signal falls here into five different pixels, um, very few photons per pixel. But I do, if I do a big binning, everything falls now into one or two pixels, and then suddenly I have one bright or one or two bright pixels in a dark background, and I start to see my signal. I'll show you um, an example from Relap. So I took these small bits, to, I went to the microscope, to the Z1 microscope on the facility, and <coughs> this is what I get. Everything stays constant, except the binning. So I do binning, so no binning. Binning two by two, so it means my pixels are four pixels grouped together. Everything by three by three, so I have virtual pixels of nine small pixels, or four by four. So how to understand this picture? You see that if I go to three by three, it's not very nice, but at least I can see my particles, okay? And if I go to four by four, I can see them still, but then here, the pixel gets so big that again, I lose now again in resolution, gets unsharp. So from here to here, I'm in the situation where at the beginning when I show you my green pattern, of course, if the pixels get very big, you start to lose the fine details, okay? But if you work in a regime where the signal is very low, actually, it never brings anything to go for small pixels, you won't, it's even worse, okay? And um, <coughs> this is, again, um, the picture I took here of different bits. I'm very imprecise. If I want to measure here the size of these two um, bits, for example, or these two objects, it's very difficult. And if I do a binning of two by two, this is what I get. So, and I can afford for it because maybe my objects are not that small. My pixels are very, very small. For many, many applications, the size of the pixel is too small, basically. So very often you could do some binning when you work on the systems. And um, here the resolution, the sampling is still good enough to measure precisely, but I have also much more contrast and I'm, I'm much more precise here 
if I need to look at the average particle size than, um, than here. And with a more true life sample, that's a sample I got from one of the users. It's a brain section, neurons are stained, and no binning, binning two by two. Basically, it's a very good picture here. Um, it's even much better, you see, if I, I can see I have much more contrast, okay? And this is, <coughs> again, the same. So now, um, this was my binning pictures. Of course, um, I'm going to do an exposure time of 10 milliseconds. And here I do no binning with a nice exposure of 320 milliseconds. So this is still nicer, but this is enough to answer my question. So when you do a binning of two by two, in theory, you can decrease your exposure time by four. Okay? Or it is as if you were increasing it by four. Okay? So why am I telling you this? Because sometimes you have a good signal. You say, well, I shouldn't do any binning. But if you do live cell imaging, it could be very interesting because if you don't need a high resolution, you do binning, maybe the image, images look a bit more pixelized, but you can decrease tremendously the amount of light you put on your sample because you get a very good contrast for four times less energy or nine times less energy put on the samples. Or you can be much faster because the picture you can expose four times less, so you can take much faster um, Time, time lapse, for example, of your images. So, <coughs> to come back to your question, it's indeed not the same as to sum up the pixels after or to, to set the binning um, option while acquiring. Because when you say binning in the software, this is what the camera does. Normally, let's imagine you have four pixels in your camera and it is red. So, what the camera does, it shifts all these pixels to by one uh, row and then the bottom row is shifted by one column, the, the um, AD converter reads this number, then it's shifted once, it reads this number, then it goes down again, next one, next one. So each pixel is read one by one, and it's just like these cubes, you know, you just move them and shift them to read them one by one. This is what it does. So if you do no binning, <coughs> I have a small um, examples and calculations, you can look at them after with the formula I gave you. I have a signal to noise ratio here for a signal of 64 or 4. 5.7, given the shot noise and the readout noise of the camera. Now, when you do binning, what the camera does is that it shifts by one row, and again, so it sums together the, the electrons, and then by one column, and again, and then it reads the signal. Okay. So it reads only once, and not four times. So what you do by binning, not only you have much more pixels, photons per pixel, but you have four times less uh, read noise. And the signal to noise ratio at the end, if you do binning, is much higher than if you were doing a binning with image post-processing. Okay, that's why it's not the same. That's why, um, I mean, it improves your picture to do, you can acquire a picture, and after, with image processing, sum up, do some image processing, it will be already better. But it won't be as good as if you had from the very beginning done some binning. Because, of this, because you will have four times the read noise, and you will add it also when you will add your pixel values. Okay. With the new SCMOS cameras, for those who know about this, um, these new CMOS cameras, which are very, very fast, uh, they are, among other reasons, very fast, because each pixel has its own analog to digital converter. So they can be read all at once. Okay? So that's why they are super fast. But of course, each pixel has a read noise. So you can still do some binning, and then you will improve your shot noise because you will increase the number of photons. Um, but there, of course, you have no improvement um, with the read noise. So here it's equivalent, if you have SMOS camera, to bin after with image processing or before. It's just that if you do it already before, the advantage might be that first you save much smaller files so it doesn't take so much space on the disk, in the memory. Um, yeah, which can be sometimes an advantage, especially if you do some streaming experiments and you stream a lot of data to the disk, maybe it's better to stream smaller images, for example. That could, be, could make the difference. But otherwise, you could also do the binning afterwards. So what is now background? I'm still in the definitions. <coughs> so the background is the sum of the different noise, so the read noise and the dark noise, okay? Cannot avoid it. And the autofluorescence or some signal coming from your sample or from the medium. Okay. This is unspecific, but this is the true signal. This is 
not a true signal from your sample. This comes from the instrumentation. And this is a signal coming from your sample. So from now on, just like I don't want you guys to come to me and say, the lasers are broken when actually you mean the mercury bulb uh, doesn't work, OK? Because then I don't understand what you mean, and I'm starting to make wrong assumptions about what could be wrong. From now on, it's forbidden to say um, background for noise. It's not the same, OK? Because if you tell me, mm, you know, I have a high background in my sample, I just wonder what I could do. So my first answer or the obvious things to do are, well, change your standing conditions, because you have background. Maybe your secondary antibody is sticky, or you need to block better your sample. Make thinner tissue sections. Uh, if you work with brain, it's very autofluorescence in the green. You may have a lot of autofluorescence, so you don't see your neurons very well anymore, because the greenish GFP neuron is totally lost in a sea of green autofluorescence, so make them thinner. Or use a confocal microscope. We'll come on this right after. So you can make an optical section. You discard all the autofocus light, and you restore a high contrast. Okay. And if you say, I have a lot of noise in my picture, then it's totally different, because it means you need to increase the exposure time. Or you do some binning, as we just discussed. Or you use a lower magnification while keeping the same NA, of course, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Because and then you can try to uh, concentrate a bit the signal on the pixel. So noise is one thing, and the background is something else. Okay, And don't say one for the other one. So all I've been saying so far was mainly suggesting that, generally speaking, I think that often many people use two small pixels for their images. And by doing so, not only they lose some signal, but also they lose time. Because it takes time to scan, it's time to transfer XPR. Unfortunately, um, for some applications, there also some people systematically take two big pixels. And I don't have time to detail it here. We will give a course during the year, or you can come anytime to us if you want to learn more about it. Um, I just want to mention it, just like you have to keep it in, in your mind, just like for the color illumination at the beginning. It's about uh, the right sampling when you want to run deconvolution. So what is deconvolution? I explained you at the beginning that when a, uh, a signal comes to your um, microscope, it's convolved, actually. It's deformed, so you get a point spread function because the image of a tiny small point source uh, object is not a point source object. It's what you saw before, this kind of rugby ball. And I told you, you can fit a mathematical equation and a function on, on this. That's a point spread function, which you can determine easily with your computers. So that means, basically, that if you know what's the point spread function of your system, you can, after, deconvolve the images to improve them, because the images you have are the result of the convolution of all the signals from all the parts of your system. But if you know how it behaves, you can restore. You can do some called image restoration, and you can restore a better image if you know this. Okay, so it's not very difficult to do. Uh, sometimes it's even very easy. But to have it working very nicely, you need to have the very right sampling. So if you um, if your pixels are too big, you don't have the right enough information on your system to be able to apply these deconvolution methods. And unfortunately, I've seen in the past, um, not anymore, because now I have this slide and I'll tell it to you, but in the past, people were taking many, many pictures and say, OK, now I want to deconvolve. And it was too late, because you cannot achieve nice results if the pixels are too big, or if the spacing in your stacks is also too high. It's other. For this, so there are rules. And I'm happy to discuss these rules with you or other members of the same team. And um, usually, when you do deconvolution, pixels have to be quite small. Okay, so. Just keep it in your mind, and we discuss it if you think, you, or if you want to try to run the convolution to improve the resolution. If you, so you will improve the resolution of the pictures, and it has also a tremendous denoising um, property, so the image look really much nicer. Okay. okay. So We spoke now a lot about the spatial resolution and the detailization and the pixel size. And um, <coughs> now we will speak about more the, the bit depth of the images. So you know, because you work on it, on all the software, you can choose between if you want to do an 8-bit picture, 12-bit, or 16-bit. So what does that mean? An x-bit picture or image is an image with 2 to the power x gray levels. That's it. So if you have an 8-bit picture, 2 to the power 8 
That's 256 gray levels. Okay, that's the definition. Okay. So now, uh, of course, the question is, um, well, okay, but should I take eight or should I take 16? Okay, well, it depends. Eight is from far enough if you want to describe features, shape, morphological properties, okay? Because <coughs> it seems that, I don't know, this, it seems that everybody agrees that your eye can distinguish something like 50 shades of gray at a time. So if you have 256 and you have already a lot of information that you cannot even clearly distinguish, it's more than enough, provided you use the full dynamic range of the camera. I will explain you what it's before. So if you do a nice exposure time where you use the whole dynamic range of your camera, you can stay in 8 bit. It's, it's very nice and it's enough. The advantage is that if you, don't go to six, if you go to 16 bit, you will get also a nice picture. It doesn't take more time but it takes twice more space on your drive. So twice more space to convert, to transfer, to save. You know, we have quota on the servers and on the M drive, so you reach your quota twice faster. So it's not, it's not a very good idea. Also, the processing takes more time. Uh, you cannot open it directly in Photoshop or to make your poster and you convert it because usually it's not the 16-bit images are not properly read by all the PowerPoint or whatsoever. So you don't, you don't save time. You, go, you even go into troubles. Uh, if you use 16-bit instead of 8, if 8 is enough. Okay. Um, if you do more um, quantitative imaging, if you do the convolution, if you do ratio imaging, co-localization, if um, you, you want to do very, very precise quantifications of your images, then you need to go to 12 or 16-bit because you lose information if you go to 8-bit. What is the histogram of a picture? So the histogram is just a representation here of um, the occurrence of um, the number of pixels of a given intensity, let's see. So here you see that I have a lot of uh, dark pixels and I have my average signal and then I have my higher signal. So be careful when you look at, for example, such an image. This is a DAPI stain of uh, mammalian cell nuclei and this is the histogram, okay? And um, I always say that beginning to the people do, when I was doing the introductions, well, you look at the histogram. It's very easy usually to display the histogram on every software we have. While you have the live window, you can see the live histogram. And then well, we we'll tell them, well, adjust the gain or the exposure time or the laser power well, so that your signal spreads nicely over the whole histogram. So then you use the whole dynamic range. You can nicely see, you will see better nuances afterwards. Okay. So that's true. But be aware that in such an image, you get such an histogram. And um, if I change the scale, you see that your true signal from your cells is here. This is actually just the background. And I said because I've seen sometimes some people, they try to put this signal more to the center, but then they try to optimize the acquisition for the background, okay? Sometimes it's hard to see the true signal because only a few pixels in the image have a true signal. And it's here, okay? These are saturating pixels. It's not good to have them, but okay. And this is maybe, for example, this heterochromatin here. Uh, we have bright spots here. This foci, we have average intensities. This is maybe the euchromatin, okay? And all the rest is background, okay? So, so um, now, of course, um, if you cannot use the full dynamic range of your camera, um, because, for example, you need to acquire very fast and you could don't can't afford for uh, long exposure times because you do time lapse and it's fast, okay? Um, then you can always after adjust the contrast. Huh? So that's why we often work with the histogram. And if you adjust the contrast like here, you can still see <coughs> the signal very well. This is called very often autoscale or minmax whatsoever on the, on the different software. What it does is just like it takes the white color for the highest value found in the histogram and the dark one for the lowest value found in histogram. So you still have all your palette and your gamut of grays to nicely display on the screen the signal. It doesn't change anything to your data, okay? The values are what they are. It's just to display stuff. Okay, <coughs> so as a rule of thumb, if you want to do deconvolution, quantitative imaging, so you take 12 or 16-bit images. Otherwise, you use 8-bit images. Dynamic range is the full wave capacity in electrons, how many electrons you can fill into your um, pixel, um, after which it can split over. It does really like water in a vase, okay? Just split over to the next pixels. 
divided by the read noise. So why by the read noise? Well, the read noise you cannot avoid. And for those who do know chromatography very well, it's a bit like the plateau. It gives you some kind of um, how many, how, how resolutive you can be. And also it tells you actually how much you can really grasp in the same image very faint signals and very bright signals. Okay. So often it, you, the dynamic range is even if you look at the specification sheets of the cameras, um, very often it's 20 times the log of this ratio. Okay. So, well, that's it. That's the definition. We buy the camera for you, so usually you cannot influence this too much. We try to take cameras with high uh, dynamic range. Okay. But um, I just give you for the small exercise to understand really what it means. If you have a CCD and the well capacity, typically it's, it's a good well capacity, it's a good CCD camera with 18,000 electrons, um, and the read noise is four. It's really a good one. Okay, um, it has a dynamic range of um, 4,500. So what does that mean? That means that well, you won't be able to do. But you see, for example, it would be it would it doesn't bring anything that if this camera would say, ah, oh, do you want to do an image in 16 bits, for example? <coughs> it, it won't because it makes no sense. I mean, don't try, because 16 bit means 65,000 gray levels. And anyhow, <coughs> you have only 4,000, <coughs> sorry, 4,500 meaningful differences, okay? So it doesn't mean anything to do a 16 bit picture <coughs> with a camera with such a, a dynamic range, okay? Of course, if you go to 8-bit, you will lose information because you could have 4,500 meaningful differences and you reduce, you reduce it to 256. Okay. But maybe you don't need all this information. Okay. So <coughs> a question which also we always have is um, how should I save the pictures? So globally speaking, you always save them and you keep them in the proprietary format of the microscope. This is why you keep all the information. Now you have two options after to process them. You can keep them in this format, and very often, depending on what format, it can be opened by other software. And if not, you may have to uh, save them as either as TIFF or as JPEG file. Okay, so <coughs> just it has to be very clear. Um, TIFF files, you will retain all the information in terms of pixel values. Okay, so um, if you save as a TIFF file, what you will lose you will lose the so-called metadata information. So usually, if you save, let's say, you take a picture on the Zeiss microscope and you save it as a uh, ZI file or an CZI file now, um, when you open the image again, you get not only your image, but you get also information what objective you use, which laser power, uh, which dichroic, so all this comes to it. So it's very interesting information. If you save as a TIFF file, the values in the image are the same, but you lose, obviously, of this information. Okay, but you can process it and quantify and measure. This is not a problem. Um, <coughs> if you use a JPEG, you will lose a lot of information, and you cannot do any quantification on a JPEG image. Never, okay, never. If you save as a JPEG, it's over. You cannot do anything. Um, <coughs> even if it's color images on the histology, and you want after to do automatic segmentation, you forget about it. Okay, so JPEG is only for a presentation like today. I have many JPEGs because they are very small. And like here, <coughs> you see I have this image. And if, if you go to a conference and you're super proud that you have discovered that the filaments are also inside or below the nucleus, as I showed you before, you can show this picture of the conference. People will believe you as well as if you show this one. Uh, just the 40, this one is 40 kilobytes, so you can have your presentation on a, power, on a small USB stick. And if you have only such pictures, then maybe you need to take your computer with you because it's too heavy to have it on USB or whatsoever, okay? So, and again here, you see that the quality is not that bad uh, when you do a small compression, okay? But you lose information, you lose information. Okay. So I use personally a lot of JPEGs when I do a PowerPoint presentation, because the, also very often my images are very big, like they're 2000 by 2000, and the pixel resolution on the beamer is anyhow poor, it's 1000 by 1000. So when I copy paste it here inside, it will be shown by on with 500 pixels on the screen. So anyhow, I don't need to keep the full resolution and full information, okay? So now we have the part five, and this is why I speak about, I give you some explanations about the different system we have. I will explain you 
if you don't know how it works, a confocal microscope works, uh, a spinning disc confocal uh, works, and also I will discuss OS because that's the red line um, along the discussion about resolution. What is better for resolution and what should I use? Okay. So, confocal microscope. So, in the principle is the following. One uses a laser for the excitation of the fluorophore, and the laser is uh, focused on one point into your specimen uh, through the objective, and then the signal comes back. It goes through the dichroic. There is a slow dichroic, just like we for the filter cube. It has just no usually excitation filter because the laser emits a very precise wavelength, so you don't need to put an excitation filter. But you have a dichroic, you have emission filters, and it goes to a detector. And the strength of the um, confocal microscope is that before the detector, the, 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 the key piece is of the scope is a pinhole. And the pinhole is a kind of, is, is, a, is a hole, just a small hole. Um, you can set the size of this hole because it looks like a small diaphragm, like in a camera. And um, the role of this pinhole is to let only the light coming from the focal plane coming through. All the rest will hit on the side from the optical design and will be rejected. So this is why with the confocal microscope, you can make an optical section. You actually excite everything. Well, you excite preferentially at the focal plane, but you still excite above and under. That's why you're called confocal. And there is two confocality. You excite preferentially at the focal plane. And you only detect the light coming from the focal plane. The rest is discarded. Okay. So that's very nice because you can have optical section and you can go without sectioning physically your sample. You can section it optically and you can make 3D reconstructions, etc., etc. And restore control, I will, I will show you after when you, about resolution, you can restore sometimes some contrast when you have fixed specimen. Um, be careful when you use a confocal microscope, you bleach, every, you illuminate also above and under. And of course, the, the laser is focused on the focal plane, so the intensity of illumination above and under is less. But while you scan your sample to create your image, um, even though you go to the next point and the first one is not illuminated anymore, because of the shape of the laser beam, above and under, there are some parts which are faintly excited, but they are always excited. Okay? So when you scan, you bleach the whole thickness. If you don't want to bleach and you want only to excite at a given position, you need to use a two-photon microscope, because with a two-photon microscope, only the focal plane is excited. So we have no two-photon microscope on the facility, but there are many two-photon microscopes in the institute. Okay. Okay. So that's the pinhole, and the ID um, of the confocal is to scan. So you have also two um, mirrors, which are going to direct the laser beam at different positions, one for x and one for y, and you are going to scan your specimen, and um, here. Okay, this, okay, so I just scanned, and um, um, this is just to make you remember that it's super slow. And actually, a confocal microscope has a lot, a lot, a lot of um, drawbacks. It's super slow because you need to scan point by point, okay? And it's super insensitive because actually, the detector on the confocal is a PMT. It's not like a camera. It works a bit like the same, but a PMT can read and reset much faster. Okay? So because you, you measure at one point how many photons come, it goes to the PMT, and then you go to the next point. Actually, it continues, but you get to the next point. And then the PMT has to quickly amplify, read how much it is, reset to zero, discharge, and be ready for the next pixel. Okay? And it needs to be done very fast because typically the pixel dwell time, which is the time you spend on every pixel, is around one microsecond. Okay. So you cannot achieve these kind of things with um, a camera. But the PMTs are not very sensitive. So what I mean by that, they have a so-called quantum efficiency. Typically, now it increases the wave, but even on the good ones are 30 to 40%. So that means that seven um, in the green. So if you look, if you work with Psi 5, the quantum efficiency will be maybe 20% or 10%. That means that 8 or 9 out of 10 photons which come to your detector, you don't see them. It's a huge waste of photons. So a huge waste of light. Okay. 
This is why uh, there are other systems, like for example the spinning disk. So the spinning disk works in the following way. You use also a laser for illumination, but the laser is not directly focused on the sample. It's actually expanded on the first, there are different systems, but I tell you the most 90%, 95% of the spinning disk work like this. It is expanded first on, on a disk which um, has micro lenses and which are going to divide this main beam into 1,000 mini beams. And these mini beams will be focused onto the sample. The disk turns, it spins, and this is why you can scan, but with 1,000 beams at a time, and not only one, your sample. Signal comes back, and parallel to the, to the disk with the micro lenses, you have a disk with pinholes, which have the same effect as the pinhole in the cross focal. They um, enable you to make some optical sectioning of your specimen. And there is here a dichroic sending the signal to, this time, a camera, because we expose, and the image is created as the disk spins over, and the, the pinholes are placed in a way that when you do, depending on the spinning disk, one twelfth or one third of a, of a turn, with the pinholes, you have been scanning all your specimen. Okay? So if you want to be very precise, what we call a spinning disk is also a laser scanning microscope. Okay? And it's also a confocal. So both systems are laser scanning confocal microscopes. Just what we call a confocal is a single beam laser scanning microscope. And the spinning disk is a multi-beam laser scanning confocal microscope. Okay? But in everyday life, we call them the confocal and the spinning disk. But they're almost the same. What are the advantages of the spinning disk? Well, you understood already, that's the parallelization. You scan many beams at a time, so you're much faster. You're not 1,000 times faster. You are between, let's say, 10 and 50 times faster, okay? Because you have this parallelization, but also because you send the, the signal to a camera. And cameras have much higher um, quantum efficiencies as uh, PMTs. So typical now, now the new CCD cameras, they have quantum efficiencies of 70 to 80 percent. Uh, the super sensitive EM CCD cameras we have on the spinning disks here have quantum efficiencies above 90 percent. So it means that almost all the photons that come to the detector gets counted, okay? So you're faster, you're much more sensitive, and this is why, and I don't go in now into details, so you can put less light, so you will bleach a bit less. And this is why typically we use the spinning disk for all the light cells, or for many of the light cells experiments, because you can be faster, you, you are much more sensitive, so you can throw less light on your specimen. It's, it's much better for light cell experiments. Okay. Of course, so you said, well, well, well just, just by only spinning disks. Okay. Well, it's not as that easy. The problem is that the pinhole size on the spinning disk, it's fixed. Okay. So it's only confocal <coughs> for a 100x objective with an A of 1.4 working at a given wavelength, like some usually greenish, reddish wavelength. Every deviation from this, if you change, if you use another objective with another magnification or not the right NA to magnification ratio, you either, either lose in confocality because the pinhole gets too, too big, it should be too smaller to really cut out nicely the, the light, or it's too small, and then you're very, very confocal, but you lose a tremendous amount of light, and then you don't detect anything anymore because you're not sensitive anymore. So the confocal microscope is the most flexible system, but um, is slow and not very sensitive, and the spinning disk system is very sensitive, but it lacks the flexibility, and you cannot, depending on your sample and the objective you need to use, you cannot always use it. Okay. Okay, just to sum up here, um, I told you the principle of the confocal microscope, um, of the spinning disk microscope, and there is, of course, the wide field systems um, with the filter cube I detailed before. Okay, so you see the spinning disk is some kind in between. Um, we use a, a laser also for illumination, but for detection we use a camera. Okay, and it's parallelized. The fastest system ever and the most sensitive system ever is the wide field system. And we still have wide field systems on the facility because for some applications, it's much better. They are much, because the pinholes, they remove some light, okay? So let's say, if you don't really need to, if you don't have much autofocus light and it's not a problem, you will be much faster and much more sensitive with uh, a wide field system. 
And then after you can always do deconvolution, for example. And then you, this is where you would be the highest sensitivity and the highest resolution. So now, <coughs> let's speak about resolution, okay? And say, what is the best system? What, what, what is the system the most performing? Um, this is our formula I got from a um, size brochure, who would speak about their different systems. And this is uh, the lateral resolution, an XY, of a confocal microscope. And this is of the confocal microscope with the pinhole open to one area unit. So you remember I told you at the very beginning we have these airy disks. And this, this diffraction pattern is sometimes called airy pattern. And one airy unit, it's the size of the pinhole so that only the first signal, this first maximum, the first ray ball goes through. All what is above and under gets rejected okay, um, by the system. Okay, so, and one area unit, it, it, it's a size, but of course it depends on the wavelength because the PSF is thinner or fatter uh, depending on the wavelength. Okay. So typically you work with one area unit or more. And as you can see, the resolution of the focal focal is exactly the same as the wide field. Same thing. If you close the pinhole to much less than one area unit, you can improve a bit. You improve at best by a factor of square root of two. And, um, but here I can tell you that the number of samples I've seen since uh, the 10 years I've been working in the facility, which would support to have a pinhole down to open 25, it's like 1%, open 5% maximally of all the samples I have, because you lose so much light that you just don't see anything anymore. Okay. So nobody ever works with, with, maybe there is one exotic application when some people tell you, wow, I work with a pinhole of 0.3, so so. Okay. Um, nobody ever works with a pinhole below one area unit because you lose light and then all my discussions, you lose light, you lose photons, you're not resolutive anymore, you get noise, it's a disaster. You, everything gets worse, actually. Okay. So, <coughs> and you see, I went to different systems on the facility, I took my bits, and I measure the resolution I get by doing exactly what I told you at the beginning. I make a picture, I measure the intensity along the line, and I look at the, how wide is this, um, this point spread function. This is on the Z1 microscope. It's a wide field system with the 100x 1.4 NA objective. This was on the spinning disk 2 with also 100x 1.4. And this is on the former LSM systems with the 63x 1.4, but where I also do a zoom in. And the relevant uh, number here is the 1.4. This is what gives me the this is the resolution power, resulting power of my system. And you see that I get everywhere the same resolution on the spinning disk, on the confocal, and on the wide field system. No difference. Okay. And I did again the experiment. Say, so, okay, let's close the pinhole. So I take very bright bits, and um, indeed I get a bit slight improvement of the resolution if I close the pinhole. But it's like, yeah, more well, squ square root of two. I mean, this is like predicted by the theory. Okay. So why do we buy confocals if anyhow the resolution is not better and they are slow and they are not sensitive? Well, <coughs> this is the resolution, the resolving power, okay? And indeed, if you were working with you would, for example, label small stress bodies in the cell and a few of them, or you do an experiment like sometimes on yeast where you have two telomeres labeled and you just want, and you have only this and you want to follow them, you're always better off, or most of the time, with the wide field system. This is the fastest and the most sensitive ever. And if you have a little bit of autofocus light, you can do some deconvolution and you will you have beautiful image restoration, much better. The problem is when you start to have many, many structures labeled, let's say you have a lot of dots, a lot of these bodies in the cell, and all of them is going to give a lot of out of focus light because you will focus on one of them and you will have all the signals blurred from the other one in the cell. Or you work like many of you in the institute on brain sections and you have a thick brain section and it's very greenish, a lot of out of fluorescence, and you label your, with herbies, viruses, your neuron, which is very, f the, the the projection is very faintly labeled, and you have no chance to see it in this super, because the, the rest of the tissue is almost as green uh, as your neuron, okay? 
So then, this is where the confocal is an advantage, because with the pinhole, you reject all the out-of-focus light, you concentrate on that very specific object, and you restore your contrast. And that's the role of the confocal. It's not that the overall resolution is better, it's just that it restores contrast in a sample where you have out-of-focus light. That's the, this is why we use confocal microscopes. <coughs>